Dear friends and colleagues, it's two past two already since uh, we in Finland are very strict with our schedules. Let's begin. You're very welcome to Helsinki. It is my great pleasure to see so many of you here. I am Sara Salomon. I'm currently working as a deputy director for the National Audiovisual Institute, AVI. AVI is a state authority subordinate to the Ministry of Education and Culture, and I am also uh, working as the head of Public Department for Media Education and Audiovisual Media. We have organized this conference together with the Ministry of Education and Culture, and this event is also a part of the Finland's EU Presidency Program. Our venue, Central Library Audit, is perfectly located right opposite to the Parliament House. And I think this illustrates perfectly the importance of culture and literacy for democracy. One of our legal obligations in COVID is to promote audiovisual culture and this cinema Regina, where we are at the moment, is also the home for our film education events. And this is why I want to start this conference with the premiere, the first screening of our short film about Finnish media education. The value of media education is broadly recognized in Finland. Thanks to media education, people in all age groups can manage their lives better, communicate with each other, participate in society, and benefit from the possibilities of lifelong learning. Finland invests in sustainable media education structures, such as media literacy policy and a media education state authority. Finnish media literacy experts also play an active role in international cooperation in research, practice and policy development. In Finland, everyone has an equal right to free public education and the teachers are highly educated. Media literacy is part of the curricula from early childhood education right through to primary and upper secondary education. You can even study media education in university as your degree major. Media education is a shared responsibility. In Finland, public, private and civil society organizations are working together for a common goal. In addition to formal education, media literacy is promoted in all sectors of life, including libraries, museums, child and youth organizations, and online communities. Together, we are building Finland into a country where every citizen has an equal opportunity to participate, make an impact, and enjoy the media-rich society we live in. literacy and media analysis, the word bias has always been an important one. And maybe you spotted a bit of positive bias uh, in our information film. At least I hope so. Uh, how we want to see this film is as a combination of an actual situation, but also as our vision of how uh, the status of media education should be in Finland. We are not short of challenges here, but we are determined to work promoting media literacy. And in order to perform better, we need to set goals and have a vision of where we are aiming at. That is why we also want to underline the importance of policy framework for promoting media literacy. This conference is titled To Watch a Good Life in 2020s. How would we know what it is to live a good life in an era we have never experienced with such rapidly changing media landscape. 
Or how can we know about living a good life on behalf of our people? The fact is that we cannot know. A Finnish education philosopher, Professor Veli Mattivalli, has described this classical Minos paradox also as a paradox of education, but also as a prerequisite for ethical education. Even though we don't know exactly what a good life consists of, and even though we can't determine it on behalf of others, still an educator must have an idea of a good life. Only then education is possible, and we can do the best with the knowledge, wisdom, and the competencies we have. That is why our conference is subtitled Enhancing Citizenship and Social Cohesion for Media Literacy. These elements are important for us organizers when talking about living a good, meaningful life. When promoting citizenship and social cohesion, it is important to try to ensure that all people, regardless of their age, social economical background, uh, or special needs, would have possibilities for learning, self-expression, communicating, and participating. But in media literacy, this won't happen without both shared general vision of what media literacy is about and specific expertise to meet the needs of different target groups from early childhood education all the way to senior citizens. We are proud to have such a wide expertise here, not only among our speakers, but also in the audience. Participants of this conference come from more than 20 different countries. I'm very much looking forward to interesting discussions and presentations today. Without further ado, I want to welcome the Deputy Head of Unit at EU Commission, DG Connect, Mr. Aldous Blakauskas, to give us the greeting from the Commission. Mr. Blakauskas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, many thanks to the Finnish President, uh, President Petro for inviting me to take up all parts of our uh, media literacy. Let me say that I'm extremely happy to be in Finland, uh, the country of a particularly high education tunnel uh, from which many of the countries are learning. And uh, I, I would like to touch upon uh, several uh, dimensions, but several points of views. Uh, which was the truth and the pink of uh, the university. So, uh, first of all, uh, from the philosophical point of view, I think we are at the start of uh, almost the golden age of uh, digital literacy and media literacy. Because uh, up to now, uh, media literacy and digital literacy was perceived as, as, a, as a subject uh, which uh, could uh, improve your. Uh, improve chances of uh, career, your professional activities in the future. But uh, as we increasingly see through the phenomena such as this information, and as besides, it was just announced by Commission President von der Leyen, uh, our democracy also uh, merits more and more attention, and its viability and sustainability. And of course, media literacy is a key ingredient in our effort to, to preserve democracy. Uh, so this is why I am a strong believer in media, media literacy and its a strong line of action in, uh, in our unit in BG, responsible for uh, technologies at the European Commission. Uh, so turning to the political aspect of it, uh, media literacy is consistently supported and right also as an important uh, Field uh, of action, be it uh, in meetings with the member state representatives of the parliament. It's, um, there are continuous calls uh, to do more, to devote, to devote more effort to media literacy. And this brings me to another dimension, the legal dimension. Uh, we are in charge of audiovisual uh, uh, media services directive. Uh, which has been uh, revised uh, recently, was adopted uh, at the end of last year. And uh, one notable change in uh, the directive is to go from a soft encouragement uh, to member states to work on media literacy to more tangible obligations to put in place concrete measures to promote media literacy. 
And uh, this not only for member states, but also for marketplaces, because video sharing platforms will have to put in place uh, measures to uh, promote media literacy and to make uh, users of platforms aware of those measures. Uh, the directive is still to be transposed into all uh, national laws of, uh, of the European Union member states uh, by, by September of next year. Uh, and the directive also envisages a uh, coordination mechanism at the European level. So, uh, member states will send information to the Commission, the Commission will get an overview of uh, what kind of measures are being put in different uh, member states. And uh, this will allow the Commission also to identify gaps and to prioritize action. Then, uh, then another dimension is money, financing. Uh, what is uh, what was happening so far is that uh, at the European level, uh, financing of media literacy projects was very much an ad uh, hoc activity. So the European Parliament uh, used to uh, signal their interest in uh, media literacy activities, used to devote uh, some budget to media literacy activities, and the Commission used to announce uh, uh, calls for applications uh, for, to, to, to launch uh, media literacy projects. What will be new with the new Creative Europe program is that there is a dedicated section to media freedom, pluralism, and media literacy. So, in other words, uh, once uh, the Creative Europe program is adopted, um, the Commission will have a more stable legal basis to, uh, to finance projects in the field of uh, media literacy on a longer term basis. So, we will be able to plan also projects uh, which could run over several years as opposed to yearly projects, which is, which is really now. And uh, finally, I would like to underline uh, the stakeholders, the mention the importance of stakeholders in uh, anything uh, we do with media literacy, because uh, media literacy um, seems like a, like a community of uh, academics, uh, practitioners, policy makers, regulators, who all have a role to play. So this is why going forward in, 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 the, in the, as far as the Commission is concerned, we will invest a lot of energy to keeping uh, these interactions with uh, media literacy stakeholders alive. And that we will do through, uh, through our expert group on media literacy, which you might see here. But also we will continue organizing uh, European media literacy conferences uh, and uh, week. So we have the first European Media Literacy Week this year, and they're planning to organize again the second edition in the, in the spring of next year. And uh, this is an excellent opportunity to get together and to discuss uh, media literacy issues. Uh, so, uh, all in all, to conclude uh, my brief uh, intervention, uh, we will be looking around for new ideas, what can be done at European level, and we will be continuing to interact uh, with all of you. So have a, have a very good conference and uh, I, I wish all the best in activities that will get to meet it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Natasha. Since we attended here to talk about media literacy, I also encourage you to uh, participate uh, in, in discussion in social media with the hashtag media literacy. But next, we are going to hear a short lecture about media literacy policies in Europe, and it's given by David Buckingham. David Buckingham is a scholar and writer and a consultant specialized in young people media and education, and he has uh, great deal of expertise here. He has directed more than 25 externally funded research projects on these issues. He's been a uh, consult for bodies such as UNESCO, United Nations, European Commission, Ofcom, and UK Government. And currently he is an emeritus professor at Longborough University and a visiting professor at King's College London. And right after the keynote, we will hear a commentary by Paddy Rossi. And Paivi is an Associate Professor of Education at the University of Lapland, Finland, and she is also a chairperson for the NGO Finnish Society on Media Education. Please. Yeah.
so I hope you can hear me. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much to uh, Calvi for the invitation. Thank you for arranging the weather. It's very good. And thank you also for having the conference in this building. I think if you haven't looked around this building, it's fantastic. It's really worth a look with the uh, upstairs. Um, I'm going to talk about um, media literacy policy um, in, in Europe. Um, it's actually very strange in the current context that we're in, in the UK, to come and talk at a European policy conference. Um, this may actually be the last time I will ever be able to talk about Europeans in the first person, or we Europeans. Um, all I can say is I am ashamed and I am embarrassed by what is happening in our country and I hope it doesn't happen to me. It's also, I think, a bit ironic to come to Finland. Um, we have a long history in the UK of media literacy education, um, but the same is true in Finland. And actually, right now, things seem to be going better in Finland than they are for us in the UK. Um, I once worked with a, an American uh, media educator doing workshops with students and he said, well, uh, we'll all come together and we'll, we'll have warm feedback and then we'll have cool feedback. Um, it, that may be better to do it that way around, but actually I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to start by giving you some cool feedback, by which I mean I'm going to start with some criticisms, some perhaps provocative statements about where I think policy is limited, is falling down, but then I want to finish by talking a bit about what I see as some positive ways forward. So, let's hope this works. Oh, yes. Um, in a way, I think that the first bit of this <laughs> okay, um, so I, I think we're in a situation now where there is a widespread agreement about the importance of the necessity of media literacy. So this film showed a bit of that. Um, personally, I've been making this argument for, for 40 years, and thankfully I don't have to make it again. Um, it's not just educators, it's policy makers who are, I think, realising at last, at long last, um, but perhaps media literacy is a fundamental element, a kind of prerequisite for the modern democracy. However, I think progress in terms of policy has been slow. Um, we can all have grand intentions, but the actual implementation of policy seems to be taking a very long time. I think there is a danger that media literacy becomes a kind of a shibboleth, a, a kind of icon to which we all pay lip service. We all agree that media literacy is terribly, terribly important, and actually it's something that other people can get on with. I think this is perhaps especially the case as commercial companies in environments. We now have big media companies, Google and Facebook, saying, yes, we agree with this. We agree that media literacy is very important. I'll say a little bit more about that later. I want to say that I think education is key to media literacy. Media literacy without media education can easily become this kind of empty gesture. I don't think media literacy is going to happen spontaneously. It won't happen simply as a result of using media. It requires a systematic process of teaching and learning. Now, I'm aware that many groups need media literacy. It's not just children in schools. Indeed, it may well be the case that older adults need it more. Some of the research about disinformation um, that's coming out now would suggest as much. So we could argue, and I'm sure maybe we'll, we'll reinforce this, that media literacy is a process of lifelong learning, not least because the media themselves are constantly evolving. But I think either way, media literacy is an educational issue. It's a matter of public knowledge, public understanding, it's a matter of pedagogy. And if media literacy is not embedded in structures 
an institution. If it's something just that we all pay lip service to or we all have warm feelings about, then really it's not going to get very far. Now, if we look in, in Europe across the last 15 years or so, there has been um, quite a history of concern about media literacy. I think there's actually a pretty, pretty really in the 1990s, but by the time we get to the mid-2000s, you can see discussion of media literacy beginning to gather momentum. Initially, it's to do with internet safety, um, but then it becomes something broader than that. So from about uh, the mid to late 2000s, you can see a succession of communications, recommendations, directives, uh, declarations coming out of uh, Brussels and the European Commission. My sense is that a lot of that activity took place in the late 2000s. Um, and it slowed down. The, the, um, the latest iteration of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive that Mr. Bukowskis talked about has re emphasized the importance of media literacy, perhaps pushed it a little bit further back up the agenda. So we're now moving to a situation where member states are required to promote measures for the development of media literacy skills and to report to the Commission about that. As interestingly, our video sharing platforms, the YouTube of this world. Um, what's gone on across this period has been a range of state the art surveys, we've seen reviews, we've seen a series of, I think, quite limited uh, pilot studies, pilot projects limited, I think, by funding consideration. But nevertheless, I think there has been some good work. I mean, a couple of examples that I've, I've looked at recently of what I think are, are good, innovative projects. Firstly, the, the media coaches movement, which is happening in the Netherlands and, and Belgium, and possibly other places as well. This is media literacy, really not so much within schools, but in the context of youth work and, and libraries. It's really a really practical initiative, something that's very scalable, you know, it, it can be extended um, quite easily. Um, it doesn't require massive system change. It, a lot of the emphasis has been on training of practitioners. Um, another example, different kind of example, um, also supported by um, the European Commission on the Horizon 2020 um, initiative, would be the transliter transliteracies project uh, coming out of uh, Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona, but with many um, European and actually wider international partners. Um, it's really interesting research, very elaborate kind of frameworks, but also, I think importantly, practical outcomes for teachers. They have a lot of material that they produce that teachers can think easily and instantly use. So there is good stuff. There is also good stuff on a global level. So we've seen UNESCO, well, UNESCO has been talking about media education for something like 40 years. Um, about 10 years or so ago, it rebranded media education as media and information literacy, MIL. Um, and again, we've seen a series of declarations, conferences. Um, surveys, uh, but I think importantly, we've also seen teacher education material. So if you look at that range of activity, you might think um, things are going pretty well. I think there are some problems. I think in the last 10 years or so, a lot of this activity seems to have slowed. Um, I think there is quite a lot of talk, but rather less action. And I am personally less that the talk is actually going anyway. Um, some of the problems, I think the first thing, what, what I would call solutionism, um, you know, this sense that media literacy is going to be the solution to just about any problem that you care to know. Oh, here's fake news. Well, media literacy can solve that problem. Here's internet addiction. Oh, media literacy can solve that problem. Um, so there's an idea that somehow media literacy will be this magic ingredient that will solve anybody's problem. I'll say a little more about that in a second. 
I think what this leads to is a lack of coherence. So we have one kind of thing happening over here around this emotion. Something else happening around uh, online radicalization over here. Something else happening here about uh, uh, you know, selling of, of data privacy. Um, and these things are not really being effectively joined up into a coherent framework. I think there's also a sense that in media literacy, people seem to keep reinventing the wheel. There are far too many uh, media literacy frameworks out there, all doing pretty much the same kind of thing. We've seen a lot of short-term pilot projects, but very little um, sustained work going on. And perhaps, hopefully, that's something that would be more of an imperative in the future. There are too many dead websites and unused toolkits that have been often quite well funded with European money that are just not being used. Too many state-of-the-art surveys and too little in the way of in-depth critical evaluation going on. And I think there's a lot of confusion about what are we talking about here. Particularly, I think, the confusion between media literacy and digital literacy. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a second. So I think we've seen progress, but there are also some problems here. Now, if I was Nigel Farage, um, which thankfully I am not, um, I, you know, I could say, well, this is all because of Brussels bureaucracy. Um, and I mean, to some extent, yes, I think there has been too much of a focus on superficial, uh, short-term appearances. Uh, an attempt to kind of look as though a lot is happening, when actually really that is much more involved. Um, I think there is too much of an emphasis on instant deliverable. You know, we need a website, we need a toolkit, and we need it within one year, uh, otherwise you're not justified for spending the money. I think also I perceive at a European level a kind of dangerous obsession with measurements. Um, Lots of talk about levels of media literacy. Um, how do we measure people's proficiency in media literacy? Now, I think that's understandable in a way. It reflects um, an emphasis on accountability. But I think there are big questions about what is being measured, um, how is it being measured, uh, why, or whom, and what are you going to do with the measurements uh, once you have them? You know, if we find that the level of media literacy Finland is 8.3, but in Romania it's only 5.8, or it's 3.2 in Spain, or probably zero in uh, or minus zero, especially if you look at the newspapers. Um, you know, what, what does that mean? What do those kind of measurements actually mean? I'm not sure really about the purpose of this kind of measurement, um, and particularly of the international comparison. You know, how is this actually going to improve? what we do. There is always the danger of measuring what can easily be measured. Um, and what we do when we do that is we measure functional skills. We measure levels of technology. It's, we're not really measuring critical things, which I think is probably all of is key to be literacy. I think there are further problems, which are, are partly about the structure of the commission. Um, I think one of the big problems over the last and 15 years at the European level is to do with where media literacy has been located. It's shifted around between uh, DG education culture and DG Connect, which is, is responsible for technology. It seems as though we now have media literacy in one place, we have a chief media education somewhere else, we have film in one place, we have digital in another place, television seems to have somehow fallen down between the cracks. Uh, we have cultural issues over here. We have citizenship over here. We have internet safety over here. So there is a problem in terms of the structure of the commission, in terms of where media literacy, and particularly a coherent policy for media literacy, might be, be developed. A more fundamental problem is that the commission has very limited power with respect to it. If you feel like I do, that media literacy is an educational issue, the European Commission has very little ability to influence education policy. Education policy is a responsibility.
for member states. So there's a limit to how far the Commission can actually enforce uh, an educational board. I think actually those problems are also reflected in other supranational bodies. I could make similar kind of arguments about UNESCO. UNESCO, it seems to me, has reinvented the wheel of media literacy too many times to mention. Um, and maybe actually looking to international bodies like this is to be looking to the wrong place. Perhaps if we want to influence policy, we need to start from the other direction and work from the bottom up. So my question, you know, if there are these problems, why is India making such slow progress? If it's as important as we agree with it, why do we seem to be not getting anywhere or getting to places but very slowly? I think there are several answers to that. Firstly, there is the point I, I made earlier about a confusion. Now, I don't want to get into a pointless debate about definition at this point, um, but I think there is a fundamental confusion about this term literacy, and I think there is a confusion particularly between media literacy and digital literacy. Media literacy, it seems to me, needs to apply to all media, old media and new media, digital media and non-digital media. Obviously, media education needs to take account of digital but digital media are not the whole story. Um, and in fact, I think that there are a lot of history of pre-digital approaches. I think there is... I think there's also a problem here, um, a confusion between teaching through media and teaching about media. Um, so the media literacy is not about education. Media. It's not about using media as an audiovisual aid in classroom. It's not about using media as an educational delivery system, a tool. It's not even about using media as a, as a way of motivating kids who are perhaps reluctant to learn. Media education is something much broader than that, and it entails asking critical questions. There's also this word information. As in media and information literacy. I think information is actually quite a problematic concept anyway. But what I would say in this context is it's important to remember the importance of fiction and pleasure and emotion in our engagements with media. But really, we need to be thinking about media not simply as a source of information, but as a, as a, a form and a vehicle for popular culture. Digital literacy is often, I think, seen in very limited terms. It often seems to be a matter of functional competence, uh, an instrumental matter. It's about skills in information retrieval. It's about learning to code uh, computer programming. Uh, media literacy, as I might want to define it, is about critical thinking. It's not just as being an efficient user or consumer of technology. So I think we could do well to be a lot clearer about what it is we're talking about when we talk about media literacy, rather than then these terms slide around. I think a second problem, um, and I've alluded to it already, is this problem of solutionism. Um, you know, you might well ask, well, why are we even talking about media literacy in, in the first place? What do we want media literacy to do? And I think one of the big difficulties has been that Media literacy, in a way, offers an answer to everybody. It's something for everybody. Um, so, at the moment, you know, the argument is media literacy will help us solve the problem of fake news disinformation. Media literacy will address hate speech, radicalisation, internet addiction. If you look back longer, we have a view of media literacy as being about operating technology, the appreciation of cultural heritage children, uh, you know, promoting stronger public media, uh, about training workers, uh, media literacy is about human rights, media literacy is about world peace. I mean, I, I kid you not. Um, so, you know, all these arguments have been made 
for media literacy. Media literacy seems to be the answer to everybody's problem. Um, and in the process, then, well, you know, what does it entail that media literacy is about competence, it's about uh, cultural appreciation, it's about old media and new media, it's about young people and old people, it's about teachers, parents, media workers, it happens in many different settings, and so on and so on. I can find you examples from the literature of people making all of these arguments and then talking. Um, and I think, you know, this raises some big questions about what are, we, what are we talking about here and why are we talking about it. I think the danger is we have this kind of solutionism, um, you know, the idea that we have a problem and what media literacy will do will be to offer us a simple solution. I think we've seen that very much with the debate over the last couple of years about fake news and, and disinformation. Um, so media literacy becomes the answer to the problem of fake news. Um, and the danger, I think, of that is that it assumes that these problems are actually going to be easily solved and they'll all go away. I want to say, when it comes to disinformation, when it comes to fake news, actually these are much bigger issues, they have much more complex um, and difficult causes. And imagine fantasizing that media literacy will be the answer, I'm afraid, is, is a bit of wishful thinking. I think in all of this, one of the tendencies that's very apparent is the idea that media literacy is a kind of substitute for media regulation. Media literacy in the UK arrived on the scene at a point where the media system was being deregulated. We were moving towards a much more free market system in media. Um, and in some ways, you could argue that what happened with media literacy was a similar kind of movement that happened in many other areas of social and public policy. That responsibility for regulation was being taken away from the state, was being passed over to what was seen to be informed consumers. So this new free market system was creating all sorts of problems, the risks, the dangers, but what we needed to do was to arm the individual, to arm the consumer to make their own informed choices about the media. I think that move, that responsibilizing of the individual, is something that's very apparent in a whole range of areas of social policy. Now we can see that in the UK and there's a story I can tell about how media literacy, even though we've had media education for many, many years, um, media literacy came onto the agenda, particularly following uh, a new Communications Act 2003. We had a new media regulator, Ofcom, who was uh, given responsibility to promote media literacy. Um, interesting contrast, actually, with the thing that I've been learning this morning is that one of the big problems, one of the big problems, was that um, Ofcom. Was is the media regulator and responsibility for media literacy is given to the media regulators, not to the public. Army is related to, in complex ways, the Department of Education and Culture, and that is a very different situation. And in the UK, what happened was that basically the Ministry of Education backed off, it didn't really want to get involved in a discussion about media literacy. And so media literacy then was very much like as an alternative to regulation. And what happened then was that increasingly it became a solution to much smaller but more easily resolvable problems. So media literacy was effectively reduced from a broader um, educational project about critical thinking to internet safety and what the head of the media literacy of on once called getting grannies online. So getting sexist as well as ages. Um, you know, getting elderly people online. So media literacy becomes, um, in fact, effectively replaced by uh, what they tend to call digital participation. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of story um, around all of this and, and what went on and why it happened. Um, but I think the key thing was that media literacy very much became um, something to which everybody would pay lip service. Yes, yes, media literacy is terribly important. 
we care deeply about the media business. But actually when it comes to doing it, particularly when it comes to doing it at the level of education policy and education practice, it really wasn't happening. And in fact, in many ways, we were moving backwards. And that leaves me asking, well, that, you know, governments may say they want critical media literacy. How far do they actually really want it? My time is running out, so I hope you can, this is going to be about three hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. Right. Um, so this leads on to, to one key question, I think. You know, where is education in all of this? I think seeing media literacy as a responsibility for regulators and not for educators results in a very limited form of, of media literacy. And I think that is apparent at the European level as well. The audiovisual media services director places responsibility. Education on media regulator, I'm um, sorry, on, on the industry, on media regulator, but not particularly on educators, because it doesn't have the ability to actually intervene in, in education policy. Um, and I find this increasingly. I go to, or I hear about high level expert conferences on disinformation and media literacy. And of course, yes, Google and Facebook are there, you know, the policy makers from Governments are there, the media regulators are there. But where are the educators? Maybe one or two academics, but where are the teachers? Where are the youth lawyers? Where are the librarians? Where are those professionals represented in that discussion? And they're not there. Um, and this happens in, in the UK as well. What you had is a conference with lots of well meaning millennials. So, well-meaning millennials with, with important sounding job titles working for corporates or NGO organizations, uh, but actually not really very much actual experience. And meanwhile, no practitioners on, on the ground. Um, so a, a, a problem, and I think there is a particular problem that we really need to address about the role of commercial companies in all of this. The story here is essentially that Google and Facebook, big technology companies, have been getting deservedly a bad press about fake news, but also about the wide areas of privacy. Um, it seems to have taken something for a very long time to realize how these companies make so much money. I mean, it was pretty obvious, really. Um, but what media literacy does is, is that it offers them a very neat, easy solution. Their problem. Well, we can't regulate them. We don't want to regulate them because actually that will undermine our, our profits and our whole business model. So, what we'll do is we'll pass responsibility for regulation to the individual consumer. The consumer will have to look after themselves. So, if you look globally, the best funded media literacy initiatives around the world are actually not in this or the European Commission, they're Google and Facebook. Um, now, I'm perhaps inclined to be a bit too cynical about this, but, you know, I wonder how much of this is any more than literacy, any more than a sort of attempt at corporate social responsibility, a form of public relations for companies that are deservedly having some different questions to answer. One of the other aspects of this, which I think is, is very interesting, so yes, it may be PR for technology jobs, but the old media numbers, media literacy can also be quite useful. What we have is, certainly in the UK, you can see um, the newspapers um, putting more money and more of their energy into promoting media literacy initiatives in the schools. Um, and I think this is part of the move that they want to make, which is to say that, well, fake news, disinformation, this is not our problem. This is not our responsibility, it's Facebook's problem. We, the old media companies, and we're all terribly responsible. We produce quality journalism. Um, and what they're doing, in a sense, is offering another form of public relations. So there is a bit of a risk in all of this, that what these old media companies are doing is, in a sense, getting themselves off the hook of some of the critical questions we might want to ask about. 
almost at the end. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think there is also a bigger problem because I think alongside the push to the illiteracy, what we've seen, certainly in the UK, but I think actually in the fashion, is education systems moving backwards. Education systems in many countries moving back to a 19th century curriculum, moving back to old-fashioned teaching methods. Uh, we have this new emphasis on knowledge, on prescribed knowledge and facts, on cultural heritage. We're seeing a backlash against student-centered teaching methods. We're seeing a fetishization of STEM, science and technology subjects. Certainly in the UK, a really significant marginalization of arts, humanities, social sciences, and media literacy um, is, is part of that. It's a, 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 and also a kind of instrumentalizing of literacy. Literacy becomes a set of decontextual skills. We're not talking about literacy as being about critical thinking or, or cultural understanding. Literacy comes to be seen as something that's about a set of decontextual instrumental skills. Now, that takes a particular form in, in Britain at the moment, but I think this is an international movement. Uh, what the Finnish educator Parsi Salberg calls the germ, the global education reform movement. Um, and what he means is this move backwards thinking about education policy where it's going. And the problem is that media literacy goes against the brain. Okay, I'm aware that I probably have one more minute, so I will, I'm, I'm going to skip a little bit, and I'm going to go, I'm, okay, well, I'm going to go to my last slide, and I'll, I'll <laughs> I'm going to go to my last slide, um, because, I, you know, I've been presenting you with a rather sad and sorry story <laughs> about why we're not going anywhere, um, and what I want to do just to finish is to give you a sense of what I think it is that we, we need. Um, and I think the answer to this is has got to be multifaceted. Um, this is not a simple matter to get any good Yes, we need policy documents. And yes, those policy documents need to focus on education, not just media regulation. But policy documents with all the fine words in the world are not going to make things happen. What we need is real commitment that is about having a plan for implementation, but being really clear about who is going to be responsible for this, about where it's going to happen. And I mean what I said, that really media literacy is not embedded in structures and institutions, then it's not going to happen. Um, what support do the people the, the teachers, the professional practitioners in these contexts. What support do they need? We need some clear answers to those questions, and not just um, hot air um, policy documents. We need, yes, obviously, curriculum models. We need curriculum models that are coherent, that are memorable, that are not too complicated. Um, what I find is that academics in particular are very keen on generating elaborate conceptual models with all sorts of overlapping circles, arrows pointing in all directions. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things that teachers, people you know, working on the ground find almost entirely useful. Um, so I, I, I think we have actually curriculum models. I, I don't think we need any more of those. We need, obviously, teaching and learning resources. And again, I would say, I don't think we need any more textbooks or toolkits that will you know, instantly solve the problem of, of fake news. What we need is resources for teaching and learning that have really been developed through a long-term process of research, of testing things out in the classroom, where teachers um, and other professionals are fundamentally involved in the process of development. What we don't want is whoever it is, government, NGOs, Google, Facebook, delivering things to teachers that teachers are then expecting to, to implement. 
what we need is something that comes much more um, from the grassroots. We need in-depth, sustained training for teachers and for other practitioners. This is not, you are not going to learn to do media literacy education in an afternoon here and there. You're not going to learn it from a TED talk. Teaching in this area is complicated. There's a lot that you need to know. The pedagogy is, is difficult. What we need is a long term, in depth um, education of the profession. And that's something I think that needs to happen at an informal level as well as formal level. It's not just about university courses, it's also about networks of professionals, it's about people sharing good practice, it's about professional development led within professional communities. Um, and I think if, if the European Commission, for example, wants to support a European media legislative community, it needs to be supporting teachers, librarians, youth workers, professionals directly for example, through teaching exchanges, through study visits, and so on. We need um, professional development to be happening, not just from the top down, but also um, from the bottom up. We need research and we need evaluation. Lots and lots of grand claims are made about media literacy and media literacy education. Uh, not all of it is good, um, and we need to take a uh, cool and um, look at what is actually happening um, and how good it is. We need to make a clear distinction, I think, which is not always made, between self-justification and proper evaluation. We need independent evaluation. Um, I think we need, in particular, research that looks pretty closely at the actual learning process. Most of research on media literacy doesn't really look at the detail of what actually goes on. It looks at the outcomes, which are often measured in quite limited terms, but it doesn't look at the learning process. And the learning process can be difficult and, and complicated. I think we also, um, as I've said, need to make research and good practice accessible. Um, and I probably don't need so many expert groups and conferences because very little of that discussion actually finds its way to the practitioners who are doing this. Teachers need to be involved as researchers in their own lives, documenting, evaluating their own practice. I think that's a key element of seeing educators as professionals. And yes, we're going to pull the bottom. Oh no, we need and we need partnerships as well. But here again, I think we need people, partnerships, and we need genuine dialogue. I think we need to be aware of partnerships that actually exclude the people on the front line. Yes, we need media companies, policy makers, NGOs, civil society organisations. But we need to find ways of ensuring that it's not those people who are dominating the debate, but we're listening to other voices. Okay, well, it's still five minutes too long, I'm very sorry. Um, I blog about this and write about this, so if you're interested, please uh, visit my blog for digestible versions. Okay, thank you very much, first of all, for the National Audiovisual Institute for this invitation. This is really a piece of cake to be talking at Buckingham today, so thank you. Uh, and I want to thank David for the excellent presentation, a very comprehensive presentation. I think you've left us with questions to think about for the rest of our lives, or at least for the rest of our working lives, I, I think. Uh, and uh, as for my uh, specific position, I will pick three of your arguments to comment. And as you will see, my arguments are very much related to my work in academia. 
So I'm a University of Lapland uh, associate professor. So that's those of you, well, all of you probably know it's up north. It's an area very sparsely populated. So that creates some specific challenges for the education as well. And my other position is that of a, an NGO uh, worker. So I work at the Finnish Society of Media Education. So these things will pretty much explain uh, my comments here. And I'll try to be brief. So my first comment is uh, about David's argument uh, about media literacy being a lifelong education issue. Yes, this is my favorite, so I'm going to dwell on that. And also, I could not agree more with David's argument that uh, there have been too many surveys, too little in-depth evaluation. Is, is this good? Because I hear my breathing. It's like, <laughs> how bad is that? <laughs> It's fine. Okay, thank you. So uh, I would vote for, of course, media education for all ages. And I think that uh, until recently, uh, media education has been mostly uh, interested in media literacy of children and young people. But I see change coming. I see a lot more initiatives in media education for older people and promotion, promoting media literacy for older people. So, yes, I do agree, we need media education research, policies, funding, because I, for instance, don't know whether the funding for media education for older people presently is. So that's a problem, I think, or a challenge, if you want to call that a challenge. And we also need more practices for uh, you know, here that uh, media, promoting media literacy for older people, for example, people over 65 years of age. Uh, a couple of months ago, we finished uh, uh, a literature review, a scientific review, on older people media education with my colleagues at the University of Lapland. So we wanted to look at how media literacy is being promoted, uh, media literacy for older people. We wanted to look at the topics, the methods, the results. And this review was kind of like confirming the thoughts or the ideas that we had. And the review actually showed very clearly, we looked at uh, dimensions of media literacy in the research articles that we found. And we looked at that. These are on the left side, you will see traditional media literacy uh, dimensions. The use of digital media, understanding, critical understanding that Henry was talking about, and creation of media contents. And it was very clear from that review that most of the initiatives and the interventions for older people uh, targeting older people's access and use of digital media. And a very much smaller number targeting their abilities to critically understand and evaluate media contents. So that was clear, and I think this might be the case for uh, younger people's media literacy as well. So that much of the researchers' focus has been on the use and access of different kinds of applications, etc. In recent years, we've had some research that points out to older people's lack of critical media literacy. Uh, that's no surprise. Who is perfect in terms of media literacy? So that's an ideal. And each of us is sort of like somewhere getting there. So it's not a surprise that older people have, for instance, difficulties in assessing uh, the trustworthiness of online news, uh, the trustworthiness of health information online. But these are now supported by research as well. 
Uh, another thing that I find in media literacy and research is that the studies that have been performed uh, so far usually look at people's media literacy one moment of time, forgetting how they develop over one's life course. So I think that's an important and critical question as well for older people, for example, how do the things that they learned in their youth contribute to the position that they are now? Or how do their uh, media literacies accumulate if they do accumulate at all? So that's an interesting question as well. Uh, just to give you an example, a uh, framework that is very common when you look at uh, older research on older people's media literacies is the digital competence framework for citizens. Uh, some of you, many of you are perhaps familiar with this framework. But the problem is that it provides very specific, universal, and I would say decontextualized criteria. The one size that fits all type of solution, which does not do justice to people living in diverse contexts, in diverse life situations, having very different needs. So we also need context, and I would argue for age-dependent, needs-based criteria, measures, and policies. We also, we, we, I don't uh, disagree that we don't need the general information. But we also need more more uh, context uh, sensitive, I would say, criteria. So that was my argument about older people and older people's uh, media education, media literacy. Uh, the second David's argument that I'm going to comment on concerns the fact, or David's argument that media education should be embedded within structures and institutions institutions. Yes, indeed. And I think we've come a long way in doing this, if I think about, for instance, Finland. But, as it is now, I think that if our aim is to develop media education for all ages, for older people as well, we definitely need to rethink the structures, the institutions, and the partnerships. Because older people are not within the formal educational system. They're not within the labor force. So how do we reach them? What are the meaningful uh, partnerships that media educators can develop in order to promote their uh, media literacies? Uh, and you may wonder, what, what, what is that picture right there uh, up on the right? Well, that's uh, my own home in the Finnish Lapland, the red building there was my home for 15 years. And as you can see, a lot of forests surrounding it. There are no media, education, media educators nearby, no educational institutions, no services whatsoever in the near 40, 50, 60 kilometers. So how do we reach people living in these sparsely populated areas you know, great media education initiatives are, you know, the uh, mission that we have. So this might need, uh, this might require rethinking the partnerships that we have. So I'm asking who, for example, should be responsible for providing media education for the older homebound people, or, for instance, for the parents of young children. So the answer might be, Okay, let's uh, partner with maternity and child health clinics. And I know that media educators in Finland, NGOs, have done this. They provide, provide materials for, for uh, the maternity, maternity and child health clinics. Yes, and I know a person there who's responsible for, for this. So, and then if you think about these sparsely populated areas, what is the service that goes there? The postal service. So, for example, where I was living, the postal service was the only one that reached me in some ways. So there are presently initiatives and have been in initiatives in Finland, media literacy initiatives, where the postal service is promoting uh, the uh, people in sparsely populated areas 
to develop their digital competencies, maybe even digital literacy, but mostly the competencies. Uh, and of course, public libraries, and for the sparsely populated areas, we have uh, what we call libraries on wheels, meaning large buses uh, taking services to people living in the sparsely populated areas. And I, as I was telling you about the uh, literature review that we did, or we finished, it's not published yet, a couple of months ago, we also asked of the research articles that we found that what kind of organizations or structures are providing media literacy education, media literacy initiatives and interventions for older people at the moment. And we found quite a, I think, comprehensive list of different kinds of organizations. And you'll see some of them here on the right side, this slide. We have, of course, we have NGOs, we have uh, universities, community colleges, senior clubs, elderly homes, social and healthcare services, public libraries, schools with computer savvy students as a resource. And my final comment, and I'm going to end uh, just in a couple of minutes, is uh, about Bailey's argument that the activity on the policy level has slowed down or maybe even stalled. Of course, this is a question of perspective and to which uh, content are you looking at. Uh, the policy framework, the European policy framework, may, may look like this, or your national context. But looking at this from uh, my perspective, it feels quite opposite. Uh, maybe we live in a bubble. <laughs> we don't understand anything. We're just happy in our bubble. But it feels like uh, we have a, a lot going on nationally. Regional. Uh, we have the national policy guidelines being updated at the moment. Uh, we have, I think, a multitude of projects funded by public authorities. Uh, and uh, we have the uh, multi literacy inscribed into all Finnish core curricula, starting from kindergarten all the way to other secondary school. Uh, but the most important thing, in my experience, is that. While we still do and collaborate with schools and educational systems, that's the basic work. We have expanded to a new places and we are working with new partners. That's kind of refreshing, I think. Uh, and I'm thinking that digital media is embedded in your lives. And I think the topic of the conference is very telling towards a good life. So, I feel that media education at the moment is, is going where life happens. Uh, so the question is, is it going everywhere? Should it be going everywhere? Uh, talking as an NGO affiliation and uh, with a, as a person with affiliations with the academia and with research, I feel that we have a lot of new partnerships and new places where we do media education. The youth work, the cultural institutions, the religious institutions, they're perhaps not so new. But from my perspective, the new partnerships come from uh, social and health services. That's a new sector for us in research and as an NGO as well. So we have, uh, the NGOs might have maternity and child health clinics as a partner. We are partnering with home care services for older people as well. Uh, and we are partnering with NGOs working to support well-being in various fields, in sports, in sexual health, in older people's health and well-being. So the partnership, I think, has uh, expanded. This is where I will stop, uh, stopping to a positive note about the uh, media education having expanded. Thank you very much. And now, uh, these days, uh, as we all know, it's very easy to find people making comments of what kind of competencies people should have in relation to media. 
but maybe let's talk about who's going to educate those people. Um, and now, uh, my colleague, Mr. Laura Pauls, uh, from National Audiovisual Institute, will discuss, uh, will discuss uh, with our panelists about professional competencies in media literacy. What are the professional competencies needed and how they vary from between different sectors of media literacy? Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you very much for your inspiring thoughts. Mr. David Buckingham and also by what I say, it was really nice and inspiring. And also, I, there were a lot of that kind of points that I think we are going to discuss also uh, next to our panel discussion. Well, so, uh, also from my behalf, welcome to Helsinki, welcome to our media literacy conference here. My name is Laura Klaus, I work as a senior advisor in the National Audience Service. And I, I, will, I will be moderating the, the following panel discussion. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, today we are gathered here around to discuss about media literacy, the skills, competence, the, the knowledge that are needed in today's mediated life. But I think it's really important to also involve the perspective of educators as well to discuss it. As David, uh, mentioned in, in the keynote, uh, media literacy without education can be an empty gesture. So now we have heard of what, what, how we look at that perspective of media literacy. Uh, we, today we have four excellent panelists, international experts on field of media literacy. They all represent different fields. The media literacy is focusing on uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, panelists uh, to come and introduce themselves. And also, if you have some examples to illustrate what the media education can mean in, in your group. Uh, maybe we can start with Alexandra.
I put a really special choice for you example of ICT that we can do in a very diverging way and to share with you the problem of the production culture of the industrial culture and you can see the last part of the video because my name is I work a lot with schools, but today I will uh, intend to share with you the work uh, we do with the museums, uh, libraries, uh, festivals, and uh, cultural institutions uh, in Italy and in Europe. We have also seen the Contemporary Art Museum uh, in Prague, with public uh, that move uh, uh, with most uh, that uh, so my my idea was uh, to share with you uh, my experience uh, above all uh, with the new things. So thank you for the moment. Thank you very much, Alessandro. And welcome. Uh, we have oh good afternoon everybody. That's well on behalf of Christina Finally coming from the Finnish National Agency for Education, which is uh, uh, an agency on the all spices of education. And the main task of our agency is to develop Finnish education system. <laughs> so I'm mainly responsible for the curriculum of history, social studies and economics for basic and upper secondary education. And uh, of course, uh, social studies for uh, context citizenship education. Uh, human rights education, media education, and many other other things. So um, now I'm I'm going to uh, uh, focus a little bit on the curriculum of Finland. We just revised our curriculum for basic, upper secondary, uh, basic and upper secondary education. Basic education from classes one to nine, and, uh, and upper secondary is um, it is like um, for uh, the ages are from uh, 16 to 19 uh, and after the upper secondary general education, uh, the students pass to legislation examination. Um, and then uh, we just uh, introduced transfers of competencies in the curriculum of, of 2016. And transfers of competencies, each of them, there are seven ones for basic education, they contain uh, knowledge, skills, values, attitudes and a will. And uh, all these uh, seven competencies are, uh, they have got uh, in the core curriculum, which is of course based on democratic values and human, human rights issues very widely. Uh, each of them have got their own uh, objectives in the core curriculum and they are linked to each school subject. So that in um, in the school level, the teachers uh, in the local level and in the school level, the teachers uh, have, for example, mathematics teachers must think about how to implement, for example, thinking and learning to learn, learn competence in mathematics in in many uh, in, in fact, when he is teaching, he or she is teaching mathematics in, in uh, it is combined with uh, certain objectives. And that's the same with all the other competencies, which are interconnected as well. And uh, um, here, um, the, if you think about or look at, look at these competencies, you can't see media literacy or media competence. So it is uh, it is a part of multi literacy, which is transversal competence number four. Um, so this is a like um, we have structures structured these issues maybe in a different way in the Finnish, Finnish curriculum. And it is the, the, these are the, the responsibilities of all the teachers to take into account all of these transversal competencies as well in the school's culture. And of course, multi-literacy and ICT competence, they have got a key role in developing media and information literacy. Um, and, and of course, if we think about, I'll show one example about very quick because we don't have too much time. So for example, uh, thinking and learning to learn competency is very important if you think about critical thinking skills. 
and it must be everywhere to take into consideration critical thinking skills. So this is just the objectives from the core curriculum uh, of this uh, transfers of competence, uh, thinking and learning to learn in one. So how to learn about information, how the information uh, might be uh, constructive, what is, for example, um, the intention of a stakeholder who has produced some information in some context, for example, a historical context or cultural context. And so uh, children learn these issues from the very first classes, and the, the same competences are as well uh, in early childhood education care, of course, in, in such a level. Uh, the level is depending, of course, on, uh, on uh, the, the development of the, of the child and, and the level of what the child needs. Um, and of course, it is very important as well to understand the complexity of the world and of the knowledge and uh, see that there are different viewpoints, different opinions, what are facts, and so on. Uh, and of course, it's really important to, to learn to use information independently and as well in interaction with others and learning as well at the same time uh, uh, democratic, um, um, some democratic competences as well, how to work together and, um, and for example, uh, you look at, at, look at the last one to analyze the topic and it's being discussed critically from different viewpoints, that is as well very important. And you have to train it from the, the very, very first classes in school. And then we come to this T4, multiliteracy, which uh, supports and includes media literacy. And uh, it is based on, on a broad text context, context and uh, concept. And uh, of course, it is important to realize that uh, that text means information produced in, in various ways, like verbal, visual, or numerous and here's the symbols and their combinations. And, and then we have got, uh, as well, uh, if you look at, um, look at uh, the curriculum of different school subjects in the finished uh, curriculum, there are some examples. For example, in social studies, the students are supported to reflect the role and significance of the media in his or her everyday life and in the society, and, and so on. And if you look at, the, at the, one of the objectives of history, the classes seven to nine, where the, the students are, they are from 13 to 19, 19. so one of the uh, objectives of history is to develop, uh, that the students are supported to develop uh, use of her competence and using a variety of sources, comparing them and forming his or her own justified interpretation based on those sources. And these are very really important uh, skills that you get uh, through different uh, subjects which are based on different sciences. And, and that is very really important that multi-literacy opens the languages of different sciences to the world uh, around the last to understand things from different perspectives, as well as media. Um, and then, of course, school, schools are having a just stop it because uh, time is running. So schools have got many kinds of activities in cooperation, in cooperation with NGOs, and for example, in cooperation with the Finnish broadcasting company. And they have as well this uh, fact-checking project that is used quite widely, more and more widely in schools. Um, and of course, the most important thing is as well that teachers are all the time updating their skills, their media skills, and, and uh, teaching skills, and using using um, many kinds of methods with this. And of course, taking into account everything that the students have learned out of school as well in, in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. And uh, then, uh, next, uh, uh, Good afternoon. Uh, 
and uh, libraries have to follow librarians, and librarians uh, uh, specific uh, role in media literacy, what librarians are doing in such field, and, and how uh, we as academics can serve librarians uh, with the needed uh, background for their uh, work in media literacy. Then uh, we have done some teaching of, uh, of librarians and, uh, and teachers also related to media literacy. And uh, actually, it's not easy to understand how to teach because it's uh, like uh, uh, a lot of teachers and a lot of librarians are very, very interested in media literacy, but nobody knows, understand what uh, what media literacy means, and they are a little bit afraid from that uh, term. And then we realize that uh, it is necessary just to try to then mystify that uh, concept of media literacy and to show somehow that media literacy is. Uh, something very much related to life and uh, related to what uh, media are doing with media users. And uh, then we were, uh, yes, we, we, we had uh, some seminars and uh, I, I know that there are hundreds of teachers and hundreds of librarians uh, taught in the frame of uh, our cheer activities. Uh, we are working a lot of together with our students because uh, I really believe that it is not possible for uh, us as a middle-aged academics to understand what is happening in that uh, digital environment now for us and to, to uh, do some research and some, some activities in that field. We are uh, doing some uh, bachelor piece together with students and uh, last one we are working now with one, one uh, very in media field experienced student is uh, about the perception and attitudes of policy makers about media literacy and its importance in black and society. One another example is, for example, middle-aged generation skills uh, to recognize commercial messages on the social media Facebook. And that's the way how we are uh, trying to work to, together with, uh, with students. Uh, just a lot of uh, different kind of activities, uh, very big passion with all, all of that work, but uh, yes, but uh, the question will, is, is arising again and again, and what is the sense of that? To having uh, like a uh, few hundreds of teachers uh, educated in, in the field of media literacy, to having some uh, librarians understanding a little bit better how media works, uh, having some passionate students about media literacy is very good. It's uh, all around the world, media uh, literacy uh, soldiers and volunteers are happy about that, but uh, I think actually it is not enough. And uh, there is a thing to think more about. I was very really happy this morning to hear uh, our uh, Finland colleagues experience what they are doing and as I told, I was very really happy to listen to David's Beckingham uh, presentation here because I really agree that uh, that kind of activities, uh, fragmented activities, uh, are not leading to some like a bright future in terms of media literacy and that there is a need to really think how to how to do things in other way. And I believe on uh, cooperation of the different stakeholders and uh, actually it is a uh, much more needed communication in between academics and policy makers and uh, industry and uh, I just want to initiate thinking about who's thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, thanks for the invitation as well, and happy to be here. I try to make it short that we have some time for a discussion. Um, I'm coming from JFS in Germany, um, which uh, translates into an institute that, or derives from um, the name that was given to us in 1949 that was used film and television, so uh, our roots are really uh, audiovisual as well, but 
during the time um, our focus was uh, opened up uh, quite a bit, and we are not only working on film and television, but also on video, on gaming, on everything which is online and digital uh, by now. So uh, what I'm talking to or presenting to you is really not just my work, but um, our institutional perspective. I'm, we are coming from youth work sector, and um, so that's the perspective I'm pushing forward um, as well. So um, what we do, we are the Institute for Media Research and Media Education, so we do both. Uh, we do research about the appropri appropriation of media um, from children and young people, but also do research into how media, especially digital media, is being used in different educational contexts. What we do as well is promote media competence, as that's the phrase we are working with, or the concept amongst not only adolescents, but also children, and uh, we are trying to uh, develop educational model that can be transferred into factors in different organizations as well. So we are trying to deliver um, material and concepts uh, that are really drawn from a practice and or designed with the practitioners and um, being able to, uh, to take up uh, for different volumes. So uh, that's a key thing we, we really try to incorporate in, into every project we do in research, uh, be, being a research or uh, educational um, activities we do, that we convey it to different audiences as well. That is practice, that is scientific um, community, as well as polit um, political spheres. And in doing that, we are in uh, different uh, networks on local national and international level, I will tell you um, a bit uh, uh, just shortly. Um, David Buckingham was uh, pointing out to solutions for everyone, so if we um, take into consideration the areas we are, um, address media competence in and in connection with different topics, we basically maybe we try to do that, but um, our notion is that really media is so, so key to different areas in our life that we can combine um, uh, the approach uh, of media education and the thematical work we develop. Um, so uh, another coin you were phrasing was uh, confusionism in terms, um, I'm sorry, I. I thought when telling you about our institution, I at least have to shortly or briefly um, uh, give you a short insight into the model we are working with. Uh, so it's uh, media competence, uh, take, uh, um, taking into consideration knowledge instrumental, that would be the doing things, analytical or structural um, reflection, that would be the critical thinking part, that um, enables to have a position towards um, our media world and um, providing orientation in any activity you do with media. So that's the concept we try to derive and the different aspects we try to um, focus on in our work. Um, we were asked to show you like one good practice and um, uh, I thought that maybe giving you an idea about youth work as maybe not all of you are familiar with this sector is um, uh, helpful for that um, and youth work's purpose is to support personal and social development of young people um, so that's Quite uh, putting uh, put it uh, uh, quite broadly, but as a youth worker coined it, like youth work is about the personality and school is about the topics, and uh, that's uh, uh, so to say like the focus it's really on personal development. Uh, it's the non-formal educational sector, which we think makes it really the place to to work on um, uh, media education, as any offer we provide. Um, is uh, voluntarily, so we really need to get the young people by their interest. And um, like deriving from a project we were working together in a um, European Erasmus Plus program with a partner here in the room with Werke uh, on digital youth work, we, we point, point uh, that phrase is that you, you, and it might be either using digital technology or making it, it as a topic. So um, these phrases are actually derived from the European Guidelines for Youth Youth Work, uh, which um, were just published last year from that Erasmus Plus program. And um, as well, there are, um, from that project, there is a good practice selection um, of 36 pra good practices from countries around Europe. And, and I'd like to give you at least a short glimpse into the video. You can uh, watch them afterwards. And hopefully that will work. Yeah. <laughs>
Was geht ab, Leute? Es geht jetzt nach Nürnberg zum YouTuber Barcamp. Warten auf die U-Bahn. Oh, no. Wir sind jetzt im ITE. Die U-Bahn ist angekommen. Wir sind in der U-Bahn. Wir steigen aus der U-Bahn aus. Vincent. Hallo, ihr Menschen. Hallo. Ein Barcamp ist eigentlich das genaue Gegenteil von einer Konferenz, bei der alles ganz genau durchgeplant ist und nur geladene Experten das Sagen haben. Das Besondere an einem Barcamp ist, dass die Teilnehmer selber als Experten gefragt sind. Ob Wissen, Ideen, eigene Erfahrungen, Motivation oder einfach nur gute Stimmung, jeder bringt etwas mit. Auf einem Barcamp geht es darum, sich auszutauschen, sich zu vernetzen und sich mit seinem eigenen Expertenwissen aktiv einzubringen. Unser YouTube-Barcamp in Nürnberg ist noch ein bisschen mehr als ein reines Barcamp-Format. Neben den typischen Sessions gibt es ganz unterschiedliche Aktionen, die zum Austausch und zur Vernetzung der Jugendlichen beitragen und für eine lebendige Stimmung sorgen. Richtig los geht es auf unserem Barcamp dann mit einer Runde Speed Dating. Die Tische sind vorbereitet mit Tablets zum Surfen und mit Süßigkeiten. Immer wieder treffen unterschiedliche Jugendliche an den Tischen aufeinander und haben die Aufgabe, sich mit drei Hashtags vorzustellen oder sich den einen oder anderen YouTube-Clip zu zeigen. Etwas Barcamp untypisch laden wir im jedem Jahr auch größere YouTuber als Gastexperten ein. Anstatt eines Vortrags bekommen unsere Gastexperten allerdings die Aufgabe, fünf Hashtags zu einem Themengebiet mitzubringen, mit dem sie sich gut auskennen. Und es entsteht eine interaktive Frage-Antwort- und Diskussionsrunde mit den Jugendlichen im Plenum. Als ein Barcamp zu YouTube liegt es nahe, auch gemeinsam zu produzieren. Vielleicht sind in den Sessions auch schon gemeinsame Ideen für Clips und Produktionen entstanden. Für die Umsetzung der Produktion gibt es dann am Abend bereits kleine aufgebaute Studioecken, eine Menge Technik und ganz viele motivierte Leute. Auch Jugendliche ohne Produktionserfahrung bekommen auf unserem Barcamp genügend Unterstützung von Medienpädagogen oder anderen bereits erfahrenen Teilnehmern. Unser YouTube-Barcamp hat zum Ziel, Jugendlichen zu ermöglichen, sich auszutauschen, sich mit ihrem eigenen Expertenwissen einzubringen, gegenseitig voneinander zu lernen, sich aber auch mit verschiedenen Themen rund um YouTube auseinanderzusetzen, wie zum Beispiel, was sind Geschäftsmodelle auf YouTube, wie läuft das mit dem Algorithmus. Das YouTube Barcamp in Nürnberg findet 2018 bereits zum fünften Mal statt. Über die letzten vergangenen Jahre haben sich immer wieder unterschiedliche Jugendliche, ob online, über Videochat oder direkte Treffen, ähm, an unserem Konzept beteiligt und es mit uns gemeinsam weiterentwickelt. Digga, bist du debbert? Warum bin ich da noch nicht früher hingegangen? Leute, das war einer der geilsten Tage. Nächstes Jahr Barcamp 2018, safe, sind wir das safe da I hope we can share the links for the videos also and maybe on Twitter or video. Uh, thank you very much for the illustrative introductions. And I think what is valuable here, here is the, to illustrate the diversity of media education and media literacy. It's a broad field, very much multiplicated field, so you know, and we have very interesting, interestingly different perspectives in YouTube when I'm discussing. But for well, my first question for you would be to go straight to the point. So I, I understand that the, the competences or the field of competences that educator needs today when they are promoting media literacy is very wide. So but could, could it be possible for you to educate or give us one central concept that you need that you think that is really needed on Just a good one. Yeah. Um, what I think is that it's about um, sparking or sparking relevant discussions uh, with young people about something they're interested in and providing with additional knowledge. And it, I think that links to David Buckingham's presentation with the, the solutionism. Um, I think it's always bad if we think, especially regarding media today, that we have the solution. What we really need, and in many phenomena, I think we need a discussion in the society, and as well with young people um, to, to discuss questions. And we're not really able with um, many of the aspects that we are talking about today. Um, we are not the ones uh, who know everything, but we really need to engage in the conversation. That could be by 
producing media that could be um, in other settings as well. When I train in museum educators, especially in the speech, I try to transmit my passion for media education. Because I think without the expression, we pay good at the search, and we do the search, we do the marketing, we do the and we combinate by the tools of this creativity. Because uh, now we don't have time to enter on the role as a main education of the creativity. But I think that uh, all the whole of cultural institution need to be to feel themselves as a creative And I think uh, we have to pay attention to the ability to put together elements that uh, can appear as different uh, and far from uh, each other. I propose to use some key words uh, to put together analog and digital. As a real scene from the short video before, because we really believe that the analog represents a wonderful opportunity to slow down the digital and to reshape digital experiences in order to have new experiences for people. It could be the visitors in our museum or students at school or young people on the youth center. I propose you and we, we do with uh, Museum Educators to put together useless and useful. Useless because uh, for us it's the intimate space where our personal inner anchors are possible. We need to give meaning to our personal experiences. A lot of these experiences are connected, are inside the media world social network reality. So we are more uh, we have more practice uh, on the useful uh, experiences why we need to do. We can also think why we don't need to do. And we can search uh, this uh, this idea we we propose uh, as a poetic and analytical because when we have a poetic uh, a divergent gaze on our on our process, we can also have unpredictable views of the world. And if we imagine that usually we are consumers of technologies, and we need to support experiences to design a process where people can experiment, not listen to speech, because it's not enough. We can be inspired from the world, but nothing changes. When we are inside a process, as in the short situation we have seen before, we can feel something different, and we can perceive the real meaning of a poetic gaze that can change my relationship with media. I think we need more and more to put together individual and collective because we have a very big problem on taking care of, on having mind a collective responsibility. I have my own devices, and at the same time, we have a public space more and more shared on digital platforms. So we all know some big problems, like the fake news or big speech. I think the Italian situation could be also a case study for, for Europe. If we, we don't take care of our own responsibility, collective, to the to sharing the collective responsibility, we risk to let people alone in understanding reality and give a meaning to something so complex that we cannot uh, open that we can do alone. So if we don't have big systems that support us in understanding reality, we need that the institution support this continuous need to give meaning to our daily lives. I propose you to put together making and a problem and doing unfortunately English is not a good translation for an Italian verb that is a disparity. It's the idea that we need disorder. 
probably, David, we need to protect conclusion and not to clarify. Because when we have conclusion, we have uh, the richness of a context that could change, it could give us new ideas. Probably we are so, uh, we walk into different contexts that uh, uh, it's better to start from complete experience and to observe what they can guide us and which kind of uh, skills and competencies this experience can, can support uh, uh, in our groups. Thank you. I think we, we need to, to move forward a bit. Uh, but I, I think uh, one thing that the Pakana was pointing in his presentation was that what we really need is the uh, in the sustainable training of educators and but uh, also asked about the education of educators. So Christina Kuna, could you have some examples from how what would be the best ways to promote the competent development of professionals? Okay. Especially for those who are already working here. Yes, this teacher, uh, yeah, this is teacher in service training, like uh, teachers, professional development projects. And we, in cooperation with uh, with the partners, the part, in partnership with uh, with other professionals, especially with professionals in community education. So, um, and, and of course, um, everybody um, are responsible for their uh, own development as a professional and, and how to how to um, update their knowledge in cooperation with the, for example, the school environment, peer learning activities, and as I already mentioned, some activities in the schools and workshops in cooperation with students who are some sometimes very uh, very competent in these issues, much more competent than the teachers. And then, of course, uh, with our other stakeholders, other professionals, more and more cooperation with our school stakeholders. And, of course, with universities as well, all together. Yes, uh, uh, I believe that uh, media educators and media literacy uh, experts all around the world are thinking a lot of about how to teach teachers and how, what is the best way, how, how to teach. and I, don't think that I would be the best expert here, but what uh, would be my input here? I would come from uh, my background, from a uh, media business, and I would tell that it is uh, very important to teach teachers and, uh, and to uh, find teachers who can teach uh, uh, students uh, about uh, how media works, what is a media role in society, why people are using media and the ability to explain those processes and knowledge about how to teach that and in general understanding about the two things. So I find it is very important and it is very important, uh, I believe, all around the world that I can tell about the uh, specific of uh, our Latvian uh, situation. Latvia is a very, very small country. We have uh, less than uh, two million of uh, inhabitants and uh, uh, around one half of them are just uh, um, speaking Latvian, which means that uh, uh, media Situation for media business is very critical there, especially for traditional media, and uh, they are uh, dying and they are surviving, uh, looking for different ways how to survive, and they are su surviving based on audience uh, interests because uh, there are not any more uh, clear line in between editorial and other uh, advertising content, and uh, it is a very important issue in terms of media literacy for audience to understand where is advertising, where is uh, editorial content, and it should be taught, it should be explained, it should be uh, like uh, showed with examples, and uh, not only about traditional media, but uh, about uh, digital media, about social media, to tell about so social media businesses about how they are uh, monetizing uh, our attention, what is happening, and that uh, ability to explain that kind of process and knowledge about that, I, I found it is very, very important. Thank you very much.
the time is flying, so we need to move forward to our final concluding question. If we want to uh, put the focus also on the future, so my next question would be, what kind of decisions and by whom would it require to, for us to have a to develop the professional uh, competences of the media educators in your own field. So, what kind of decisions should be made and why would you? What's the start? At least in theory, it is uh, the responsibility of our government. The question of policies and the question of uh, universities, how uh, they are, what they are negotiating about the budgets, <laughs> what are the the priorities, and that's what it is the same is uh, we come to the teacher training, teacher, teacher's initial training in universities. Uh, what is the curriculum there? And then that's what teacher in service training, which is uh, the responsibility of, of the Ministry of Education and Culture, and we uh, are then dealing with them when when uh, we are uh, then, um, then uh, choosing the, the best place of, of uh, teacher in service training to teach professional. So it is, uh, it is the responsibility. Of course, it's very important then to have the other stakeholders as well. And you as well are part of that business <laughs> where you come from. Thank you, Christian. But adding to the funders, I think uh, the organizations, like the, either the school or the youth work organizations, are really important as well. As we see from uh, that, there are good practices around. Um, but our experience is that, um, like, Apparently, teachers and educators find their ways to build up their skills and ability to deliver um, uh, media education. But um, as soon as one of these uh, persons uh, changes the school, sometimes the school uh, might like just not have the capabilities of um, delivering media education anymore, and that's. It's, it's sort of a frame that, that there needs to be on an organizational level the idea that how do we manage to be able to deliver media education? Um, that, that's something I think we need to focus on. That's where we can experiment with the proposal in teacher of our different studies. I don't know if we have time to touch up the show. I think probably not. Probably not. So if you can give it to the public, then you know all that Alison has a, has a great story <laughs> and that she wants to tell with the copy break. Good luck. This is my very last comment, but I, I uh, very much agree, David Beckingham, about uh, uh, that uh, responsibility of, on uh, industry, but, but, but what is uh, known in the field, and I would also think it is very risky uh, just to rely on, uh, on such uh, self-responsibility in such a field, and I would also think it is very, very carefully uh, that there is a need very carefully to watch what is happening uh, with uh, uh, coming, uh, incoming finance in the field and sources of financing of the field from where the money is coming. And, uh, and what, what I, I can see, you know, for example, in both countries, that uh, uh, there are technology companies, there are uh, different uh, stakeholders interested in our strategic defense, and uh, just to, to compare and to leave a comment as uh, for your consideration, that uh, last foundation from European Commission, last call, which is around uh, 500,000, known for all of region and compare it with 1.5 million uh, call from United States uh, 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 United States Department last uh, last summer for three wealthy countries and media literacy is uh, something should be like a, a, like a broad agenda and, and, and something to think about. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think this is uh, Great place to stop for the formal panel discussion. I want to thank for all the panelists for all your efforts that you have put on for this panel discussion. I think it gives us a great 
much of IDs and the news also for the future. So I uh, suggest a round of applause for the panelists. Thank you very much. And we can continue this panel discussion also in the inform in for informal setting outside in the uh, coffee break. But uh, I was wondering if you could ask a question. Uh, do you remember the Muppet Show? Yes. It seems to me that you look like a Waldorf and Stata. <laughs> although, I'm, although I'm a little younger than uh, Waldorf. <laughs> okay, this is a good starting point. You're trying to focus on very well uh, elaborated visions of media literature in the future, and you see the Muppets here in the front of the audience. Okay, let's. Would, would you tell something else about this? Yeah, educate older people, yeah. So, for the beginning, allow me to present myself. I'm the vice president of the Chronic Media Council and independent regulatory authority for electronic media in Croatia. I've been uh, in the agency since, since 2015. Among other things, I'm responsible for media literacy and I launched a number of projects related to media literacy and protection of minors in electronic, in electronic uh, media. Uh, with, uh, uh, like a web portal for media literacy, for example, and project titled Media Literacy Day. Before joining the agency, I had spent my entire professional career, almost 25 years, uh, in audiovisual uh, industry and electronic media, working as a journalist, editor, editor in chief, and TV producer. Uh, among other things, I was I worked as a Zagreb based correspondent for BBC World Service. I was also the first head of the news RTL television in Croatia, and after years in journalism, I was producing the series. This is just to provide context for my Okay, maybe we now hear what Nicoletta has to tell us. Hi, Nicoletta Fotiade here from Bucharest, Romania. I'm a media literacy educator and researcher, and uh, I want to thank Kavi for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about uh, future of, of what I think about the future of media literacy in Europe. Um, so sorry I couldn't join you at the conference in, uh, in Helsinki. Um, so big questions, what are the most important ways to achieve media literacy in the future Europe and what kind of decisions are required? Well, I think uh, this depends very much on what sort of media literacy we aim at. Uh, and I give you this example. Uh, only a few months ago, a Romanian MP proposed a draft law to include media education in the main curriculum as a separate subject. Um, it, it is the first ever um, a draft law in Romania, so you can imagine uh, the joy in our community of media educators. Uh, only that the draft law is poorly researched and written in terms of uh, learning objectives. Uh, the focus is on fake news, of course, uh, and how to protect our children against it, against fake news. Uh, it is intended only for the sixth and ninth grade. We don't really know how uh, this decision was made, on what grounds. And, and it uh, being uh, proposed as a separate subject, it suffocates very much an already jammed curriculum. So, uh, just to mention a few of its, of its flaws. Um, the draft law has been criticized and its initiators had no real debate with us, the professionals in the media education field. Uh, so the question is, what do you do in this situation? Uh, you support the initiative because even if faulty, it is the only one. Um, and how does a faulty uh, start affect uh, the future of media education in our country? So difficult question there. Um, I see this trend among policymakers and funding bodies to support small projects with poor learning results and uh, no evaluation of the learning. And I see uh, less support for more academic long-term programs that could allow evaluation of the learning progress and the improvement of the teaching approach. Uh, 
I also see continuing interest for this uh, immediate results with tiny investment. Uh, and we, as media educators, uh, many times conform with this um, uh, conform with this criteria because we think it's better something than nothing. But is it enough for the future of media education? I think the key here is are oh, is open-minded uh, policymakers who understand it is about education first and foremost, and then about media and communication and fake news and cyberbullying and manipulation. You know, all those, all those uh, sound bites uh, that trigger strong emotions and then policy and funding. Uh, but good education needs long-term investment. We need open-minded policymakers who understand that media education cannot be taught as a solution to a problem. It is not about the fake news in the first place. It is about education, education about media. We really, really need policymakers and funding bodies who understand that long-term media education programs focusing on critical and creative learning about media increase the chances to grow media literate students. If this is not understood and if the media literacy organizations and institutions submit to the current funding criteria to develop short-term, very specific media literacy projects without a fight, then what you see today will be reproduced on and on for the next 20 years, at least. Um, media educators need support. And the key word here is solidarity. They need support to contribute to relevant media education programs that produce relevant media literacy. What does that mean, the word relevant? Um, it means more chances for, for the students to actually use what they have learned in the classroom in real life situations. Media education programs can happen in both formal and informal education at all stages, including adult education. And yes, this costs money, time and energy. But the later costs of not having these competencies included in our kids' education will be much higher. And I think um, to go further and to, to sort of evo um, have an evolution in our media education field, we need some more strategic moves in Europe like, for instance, the reorganization of the media literacy expert group at European level. Uh, we also need national and local authorities and funding bodies to encourage a more systematic approach to teaching media education from the earliest ages. So we need to invest in policy, in public funding of the teacher training and school education, uh, and very important but often overlooked, we need to invest in evaluation of the learning progress and its impact in the real life situations. Finally, I think um, better cooperation between stakeholders is again very important. Uh, and I understand here media educators, researchers and public authorities. I, if these conditions won't happen, then I'm afraid the future of media education will be mainly limited to two-hour workshops and civil society projects with short-term results, which are good initiatives, but as I was saying, not enough. Uh, the future of media literacy in these conditions will be stranded to scarce competencies with no continuity, I'm afraid. So not a very optimistic view of the future of media literacy here. Thank you very much for your attention and good luck with the debate. Bye. Okay, now fingers crossed that Helsinki City Library's Wi-Fi is on. For those of you who don't have mobile internet, um, the thing is that uh, you go uh, to www.meku.fi slash one and there you can vote whether you agree with the presented vision 
Of course, this is a very short version of the present vision. We took one uh, statement out of it. And then, whether you see it's going to be widely in your country or not. Okay, then we see the result. <laughs> and the, the, the thing is that uh, you don't have to vote at the same time. <laughs> you can check what I was saying and what the friend Yeah? Have you found the page? Are, they, are you pressing the buttons? Are you giving 12 points to Romania? <laughs> and let's see what's going on. So, we see that we have very different situations in our countries because first, if we look at the um, Likelihood? Okay, I'll explain it to you. We have likelihood here, so we have people who see this scenario that uh, uh, in, invest, investing is going to be towards systematic, long-term media education instead of small projects. Some of you think that it's definitely going to happen in your country, and some of you don't. But that's the situation, because we have very different situations in the country. But with the agreement, I think we have much more consensus there, that people are, in general, uh, thinking that this is a good thing, what Nicoletta is presenting to us, that we should invest in, in long-term media education work. Well, that, your comments. Well, the point here, uh, very often public authorities want instant without, without substantial or knowing investments at all. Media literacy should be strategical, comprehensive, systematic, well-developed a project, and we should all work together so it becomes one of the basic values in your What do I understand from the basic values? All we understand, the most important value is democracy. We all value democracy, in the democratic process. Uh, therefore, being media literate is the same as having the right information for freedom of expression. Um, and I agree with you that this process demands substantial investment in time and uh, money. But honestly, we may even have to pay much, much uh, higher price. And to achieve this, what we told us that we need cooperation from all levels, we need to create a partner together for stakeholders and develop a long term project, including finances and alternative funds. So, do you think that this kind of development will happen in Croatia? Uh, yes, yes, I hope so, because we're starting with a uh, long-term project, and, but now we need a legal framework for, uh, for media literacy and uh, for our project. For my part, I mostly agree with her, but not totally, because I think that there are time and place for short-term projects. And there are, for example, conferences to be organized or, or books to be written that can be very well short-term, small projects. But, but I think everywhere across the Europe and also in Finland, this has been going on for decades already, I think, that people are settling for the very small project even though everyone basically agrees that uh, uh, long-term work has uh, more effects, and even, even the policymakers are admitting it. But when it comes to funding, there is 
a big gap between the talk about the importance and the money flow coming in. And, and I think that also people in general work better when they don't have to be afraid of their uh, next month salary, for example, that also short-term projects can be conducted within the long-term work. When you have the good basis in your long-term work and, and you know that, that your government or whatever funder has invested for your long-term work, then you can be more brave to experiment and, and to have this kind of short-term intervention. <laughs> no, I was just asking whether you have anything to add or should we go to Boba? To Bo? Okay, let's go overseas and see what United States has to say for the future of Europe. Greetings to everyone in Helsinki, Finland, gathered uh, to discuss media literacy. Uh, my name is Paul Mihailidis. I am a professor of civic media and journalism at Emerson College in Boston, Massachusetts, and I am also the faculty chair and director of the Salzburg Academy on Media and Global Change, which is a dynamic uh, project that looks at global media literacy uh, with a network of institutions from around the world. Uh, my work and research is in the intersection of media literacies and civic engagement. So what are the necessary skills and dispositions for um, citizens to have meaningful, uh, meaningful engagement with their communities and their societies? Uh, I'm here today to offer some quick remarks to you on uh, what I can see the best scenario for media literacy in a future Europe. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question to answer in such a short time. Um, my thoughts on this are that media literacy suffers from a, a suffers from a, a problem of focusing on skills in a time when the technologies evolve far more than our educational responses may dictate. My response to that is that our, our best hope for media literacy in a future Europe is to tie it to the to, to the to civic intentionality, to uh, a focus on how citizens meaningfully engage and worry more about the types of environments and infrastructures that focus on civic engagement more than simply what skill is needed to meaningfully um, deconstruct a media message. Now that doesn't mean that's not as important as the civic angle. I simply means that if we don't connect our media literacy training to civic, uh, to our civic priorities, then we run the risk of training people to be media savvy without offering them the necessary space and ways to connect their media savvy to civic cultures. The most important ways I think to achieve this, they have to do with a mix. I think we need policy reform. Uh, I think we need our governments to be prioritizing media literacy as their form of civic education. I think we need more funding and resources to go into communities where people can do this type of training, where it's not just how, how, again, not just about media production or media deconstruction, but more about starting to build local community initiatives that focus on media's role in them. Does not focus solely on that, but prioritizes how you can make positive social change, inclusive civic, communities, and what roles can media support that. Uh, the decisions that are required, it's going to take commitment. It will take commitment by policymakers, by local governments, by community stakeholders, by educators. It's not an easy task. There will need to be uh, cooperation across various factions in the EU. In my work in Austria, uh, we try to prioritize bringing together different groups to understand their infrastructures and see how we can learn from each other. Um, the decisions to me involved seem to be quite straightforward. Uh, they seem to revolve around prioritizing this as a response to uh, the growth of populism and extremism, as a response to, uh, to backlash against immigration uh, policies, 
as a response to the siloing of our communities and the reliance increasingly on technologies to facilitate civic dialogue. I think media literacy, specifically civic media literacies, need to prioritize these approaches um, to, to make inroads. We must avoid concentrating on simple lesson plans as curriculum as solutions to a problem. The, the, the focus of media literacy as solutionism oftentimes might lead us to more smart consumers, but might take away from some of the connections that media literacy can make to civic infrastructures. Um, so those are my words. It's, it's very brief, but I'm, I'm really happy I can share my wisdom or any type of um, thoughts with you on this topic. And I would love to connect with, um, with, any, with anyone who's interested in talking more. So best of luck for your, con for your conference, and I, I hope to be uh, more present at future events. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, and no surprise this year. Now go to www.mecum.com. Do we have a wrong address there? Okay, but slash two is the right one, right? Okay. okay. Has Europe quality? Okay, it's time for the result. And you can still, if you if you didn't have time to tap the button, you can still do it. Maybe we have a little. More mixed emotions here than previously, especially well agreement, a little bit less than with Nicoletta's scenario, and likelihood it depends. <laughs> but only two people are seeing it very likely to happen and very unlikely to happen. So. It is kind of happenish around the countries. What do you feel about this other? Yeah, mixed feeling about all too. I'm not sure what to think about. Okay. <coughs> okay. In general, I agree with all, uh, most of what you said. I believe we all understand that the media education should focus uh, on developing critical thinking rather than developing uh, technical skills. However, this should be in the first place being the focus of decision makers is very important in curriculum design. Furthermore, I agree with his statement uh, that in order to strengthen media literacy, we need new media literacy policies, particularly national, but also maybe a new umbrella strategic document as a guide. What we need are comprehensive policies uh, that may predict the outcome and contribute to mutual understanding of the needs and aims. <clears throat> Nevertheless, on one thing, I do not fully agree with the poll. Personally, I see it as creating a platform infrastructure. It's not priority for civic engagement, but education, media education. <coughs> we should first develop the individual skills of citizens develop the critical media literacy. I believe when citizens and media said that they know how to decode and understand media messages, when they know how to produce media messages, they can also protect themselves from manipulation and organize themselves. First, we need to empower individuals, enable them, and then provide the infrastructure for civic engagement. Okay, for my part, 
Well, I have also mixed emotions because, of course, ability to understand media has been like the cornerstone of media literacy. Also, on the other hand, we see that if we are teaching media literacy only happening in some kind of academic emptiness, such as a lesson plan, that this is how you do it, it doesn't correlate much to real world. So I think this is kind of uh, what comes first, egg or the chicken situation, but I think we need both, both the structures to emphasize participation, but also at the same time uh, teaching, uh, teaching media literacy in real life settings. And for example, I'm very proud of our early childhood education curriculum because there it's said that me, task of media education is to promote children's participation in their own uh, in their own um, settings. So I think we need different kinds of infrastructures for participation. At first, local ones, and and then more uh, more abstract, uh, more bigger platforms. But. Uh, Yes, it's it's hard to learn media literacy without any connection to real real life and real participation, but yeah. the policy engagement, I understand and translate it is that we need to develop the programs of life for media education for all generations. Therefore I should emphasize that it is essential to develop the concept of uh, media literacy as a life on the Oh, I fully agree with you. Lovely. Do we have time for the comments from the audience? Okay. Is there anyone who would like to present a comment or maybe a better scenario for media literacy future? Anyone? No one's commenting on it. Okay, thank you. One, two, three. Thank you for the great talk. And uh, one, one of my questions with the, the second post uh, idea about the, the tech giants that we that surrounded, uh, surrounded the education, around the education. So we, the teachers are using Google Suits, Google Classroom, and the media companies, local. Uh, for the local newsrooms, they are more and more uh, do more work with the tech companies to uh, provide their services as a part of media literacy. But what what I what I concerned with this kind of infrastructures from the private side, uh, can we as the David Buckingham commented today that how can we uh, bring them into the core of the education with educational value? Uh, when they think their services is for the users, not for the, the future generation. And I, I see that some of the attempts that in Asia, for example, in Hong Kong, Singapore, in South Korea, uh, Googles are supporting the local journalism, uh, journalists to use their tools. And it helps tools, it, it helps teachers as well, because they can use this for the media literacy program. But still, the education, the Ministry of Education, don't have such tools or infrastructures. They can be used by uh, teachers or parents without without the, the danger of the personal information or the price. And that, that I, I just want to uh, listen to other uh, European Union's thoughts because we have been thinking of this issue for a couple of years. Thank you. I think that also uh, reflects on Nicoletta's idea that do we settle for something because the option might be nothing or do we claim that we must have good options. I think that also uh, connects with uh, cooperating very much with the big corporations that, that do we settle for the situation that they are the only one offering us something and that's why we are bound to them and teach people to be their consumers instead of critical media producers themselves. It's a tricky question. Anyone? Commenting? Yeah. 
Hello everyone, my name is Clinton Lochner and I come from uh, Media Policy Division from Ministry of Culture of uh, Latvia. At first, thank you organizers for this conference. I really appreciate that we are not going round and round about the same issues, but there are some new inspirations, some new ideas. Thank you so much. And I'm wondering, uh, today there were a lot of conversation about long-term projects, about in-depth projects. But uh, what characteristics are characterizing long-term projects and uh, how they differ from short-term projects? Maybe you have some examples, good examples, which can be shown as best practice of a long-term in-depth media literacy project. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any ideas? Oh, are we looking for comments from the audience? No? Anyone want to share a good example of long-term good quality initiative? Well, I'm not sure, but, uh, but I think that, for example, Nils uh, is representing one because you have a long-term experience. Um. It, it probably would take too much time to go into details of, of, of projects I would think of, but um, as research was mentioned, um, we actually faced the, the situation that sometimes we have the demand to, to do research on a topic and get like a year or less. Uh, and you can't do proper research within that uh, time. It, it goes rather to the um, aspect of uh, doing uh, market research or something like that. And um, that is some, an affordance we are confronted with uh, quite often. Uh, but um, long term doesn't need to be 10 years, I think. Um, but three years is good uh, is a good um, perspective already. Um, more is always welcome. But uh, within three years, we have the time to, to dig into um, a topic, to develop something, to test it, to reiterate on it, and to uh, Co, uh, like to, um, um, to, to, how do you say it in English? To, to do the research and the scientific um, uh, work at the same time. So three years plus would be long term. Um, maybe with the perspective that you um, have like, like some some additional uh, time onwards. I don't know, David Buckingham, do you want to add to that or um, 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 time? I think you're right. Yes, you need to particularly if you want to do the survey. I think if you want to basically answer the question of does media education make a difference? And you want to answer that question not in the sense of well, well if you teach children things, do they pass the test? That that doesn't answer the question. The question is really what difference does it make in terms of everyday life in terms of how people use these skills in particular context. Well, that's, a, that's a difficult question. It's actually a difficult question to ask with any thing that you might teach. Yes? I mean, if you were looking at his history teaching, effectively. Yes? I mean, if you're a history teacher, you imagine that you develop a historical consciousness and people think about history when they make judgments about you know what is happening in the contemporary world. But actually trying to answer that question, is history teaching effective in media literacy education effective? It's a really difficult question in terms of education so I I do have one other I mean and this is a just a question. I, I and I've said this before before, but uh, my question is, what is this civic thing? Yes? I mean, he says, he says, uh, you know, we want to counter um, populism and extremism. So he clearly has an idea of, you know, which politically, which kinds of things he thinks are good civic engagement. And I would say that if you look at social media, if you look at the infrastructures and how they're being used, actually the populists, the extreme right, have been very effective in using those infrastructures. Um, and we are seeing the consequences of that 
in the US, we are certainly seeing it in the UK as well, and actually in many other parts of Europe. So I, I slightly worry that we use this word civic, nobody's saying we don't, we mustn't be civic. Yes, it's one of these words that everybody says, yes, you know, we agree with that, it's a good feeling. But actually, what does it mean? And how do we differentiate between things that are good civic engagement and things that maybe we don't want? Thank you. This is a thing, thing to think about because I think most of us would be very happy if you would just make people media literate and they would also magically turn into good persons at the same time. But it's a more uh, difficult issue than just making people media literate or even critical thinkers. Well, do you have any 30 seconds? Final comments? No, not, not at all. <laughs> but I completely agree with Mr. Buckingham about CV engagement. It's very good point. Yes. Since the time is actually flying, and, and it's time for me to thank you all for participating, thank you all our speakers but for the thought provoking presentations and comments. Now, uh, Let's give a big hand for my team of colleagues who have worked very hard to make this conference happen. And finally, the concluding remarks will be given by Mr. Jorma Valden, the Deputy Director General from the Ministry of Education and Culture and its Division for Copyright Policy and Audiovisual Culture. Thank you. I hope that I could use that, that microphone, but it, it, it does not work properly. Does it work? Okay. Okay. It is uh, this way. So it's late in the afternoon, but I hope you still uh, stand a few more minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and colleagues. First of all, I would like to express my pleasure that our session on media literacy has brought about such broad interest from various member states. In the time of global media culture, enhancing citizenship and social cohesion through media literacy is an endeavor that calls for both national and international cooperation. At the age of accelerating mediatization and digitalization, media has an influence in all aspects of our lives, both at individual and societal level. Given the complexity of the matter and the fast pace of developments in the digital environment, policies and actions that take on board different sectors of society are needed. It is our common responsibility and challenge to empower our citizens to form their own views on societal issues and actively and effectively participate in democratic society. The high level of media literacy is a key factor in enabling citizens to make informed decisions in the digital age. This afternoon, the focus has mainly been on two topics, the media literacy policies and the media education competencies that are needed in order to successfully promote media literacy. Let me start with the latter one. We should discuss media literacy as a set of context-specific variables. Different media education realities call for different professional competencies, as very well illustrated in the inspiring panel discussion with experts representing the education and cultural sectors. There are, in fact, no one-size-fits-all solutions. It is also important to understand the need for a co common ground between the different professional fields 
with regard to media education. Topics such as promo promotion of critical thinking, communication skills, and creative media production can offer opportunities for shared discussions and shared understanding. That is why we consider it so important to have these meetings that bring together people from different backgrounds and professional fields. But it's not only about discussing issues that matters. This brings me to the second of our main topics today, policy. To allow practitioners to develop and carry out quality media education further investments in professional competence building at initial as well as in service training levels are needed. We can, together with our stakeholders, Look for new ways for making this happen. Ladies and gentlemen, in the beginning of our session, America's professor David Buckingham gave us a very informative and interesting overview of the evolution of European media trust policies. While looking forward, we can also rest assured in the fact that there is a lot of expertise and experience to draw from. We now have a good opportunity to make use of this expertise at EU level in the context of the implementation of the revised audiovisual media services directive. From a Finnish perspective, we believe that there is a lot to be gained from further enhancement of cooperation between member states in the field of media literacy. As we all know, Media is almost omnipresent in our daily lives. Today, we had a chance to see videos presenting thought-provoking visions for the future of media literacy. Moving forward to the 2020s, we are once again reminded that there is more than one side to all development. With a rapid search in information, we have also seen the rise of mis- and disinformation, increased opportunities for democratic participation via digital tools have shown there are vulnerabilities in our democratic systems. New forms of community can mean less inclination toward open dialogue and more toward polarization. In facing these challenges, we can do more than just react. Proactive approach to media education can help us counter these potential threats. People who are well informed and confident in their critical thinking are less likely to accept simple answers to complex questions. Media education can empower and encourage active citizenship thus promoting social cohesion and democratic dialogue. I am sure that everyone here today believes that citizens of all ages should have access to systematic, high-quality media education. To achieve this, we need cooperation between different sectors and actors. While media education can be the only answer to the growing complexities in the world, it needs strong advocates to develop new cross-cutting approaches. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of this session. I personally want to express my gratitude to all of the speakers of today's session, as well as those who have worked hard to make this conference happen. And special thanks to the Department of Media Education and Audiovisual Media of the National Audiovisual Institute. Thank you. And those of you participating in the two-day conference on audiovisual policy, I look forward to seeing you later, tonight and tomorrow. And for those of you living in already tonight, I wish you a safe trip home. Thank you for being here in Helsinki today.
That's our fault. Thank you. <laughs>